Alrighty, glad that I got done relaxing after my last video. Uh, time to make a new one. Um, oh boy, is it July? Oof. <laughs> Alright, um, guess I better step to it then. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. I know this old adage to be true, because when I think about Y2K, my mind isn't immediately filled with thoughts of hate and rage. It's been so long since I've experienced it that I'm not even ashamed to admit I feel a little fondness when I think of it. Though maybe that's just because I adore the theme song and I'll sometimes listen to it for its own sake. It just has such incredible atmosphere. Now, since I've written this introductory paragraph, I've rewatched the Snakerer's video on Y2K and holy shit, how we forget. Y2K is truly in a league of its own and not only with how bad it is, but how much it manages to obfuscate its own flaws and its own point through sheer girth and lack of clarity. Luckily, I wrote the script from a more disconnected place, which is good because otherwise I'm sure the overwhelming doubt Y2K creates in the mind of someone analyzing it will take up half the run time, and I want to give this scene as fair a shake as possible. I wish I had the words to convey what thinking about Y2K for too long does to a person's brain. I've seen Eldritch Tombs list befuddling than this shit. Back on point, I watched a let's play of the game a few months after it was released, more or less as a dare. I greatly disliked it and everything about it, but I can't deny that something about it is engaging to me. It took me a long time to recognize, but I was actually disappointed by the game, which might not sound so strange off the bat, everyone knows Y2K is bad, that's hardly a revelation, but in order to be disappointed, I first had to have built expectations, to see something in this story and these characters and be let down by them. I don't know what it is, but there's something in Y2K that draws people to it. The kind of response Y2K inspires in people is unique. It's well above people going gang bad, and well above the response a gang gets when it is just bad. It lights a fire in people. An extremely confused and pissed off fire, but a fire nonetheless. Now, Y2K has gotten a lot of well-deserved criticism. I'm serious, if you haven't experienced the game for yourself, first of all, don't. Second of all, it is truly worthy of being hyped up for its awfulness. It has flaws so far-reaching and difficult to even verbalize because it's hard to tell what's intentional versus what's a fuck-up that would be exhausting to list. And I'm not going to since so many have done so before. Of the criticisms, one that is very often a highlight, or perhaps a low light, is the golden alpaca scene. To summarize the original version of the scene for those not in the know, Alex, Michael, and Vela have been investigating into the disappearance of Sammy Pock caused by soul survivors, which are the souls of people who have committed a spiritual suicide and left their reality. According to Vela, who has entered the soul space, this shouldn't be possible, as soul survivors aren't violent nor even very driven. During this investigation, the gang is contacted through the paranormal discussion forum they've been using for leads by a guy named Rory. He says his sister disappeared recently, and while he doesn't know anything about Sammy, these two cases might be related. Long story short, Rory takes the gang to the sewer, his sister's last known location, where they find another soul survivor. Rory claims that this is his sister, on account of the fact that it understands him in a way only his sister could. Vela says this isn't the case. This soul survivor is actually a Rory from another reality, who has gone through the same pain he's going through now, and Vela asks Rory to be honest about what happened. Rory then admits he's been lying. His sister didn't disappear, she committed suicide. Rory blames himself for this, believing that all the bullying she suffered through was because he was her weird brother. The grief and guilt got to the point where he was on his way to becoming a soul survivor before he met this one. Vela, for the first time, opens up about her experiences in the soul space in order to comfort Rory and provide guidance for him. While it's restricted some by the quality of the writing, the sprite work not really conveying all the emotion of the scene, and Alex butting in every five minutes because he may well literally die if he doesn't, it's a solid scene, all things considered. And then a golden alpaca shows up, and before the gang can run, he starts a boss fight wherein he shouts lemonade as his best battle cry, and if that sounds sudden and out of place, it's even more so in the game. It sucks all the dramatic tension out of the moment, and I've heard it stated more than once that it feels like it's making fun of Rory more than it is providing levity during a dramatic moment, or pacing story and action, or whatever the fuck goal the writers had with this scene. And well, they've changed it. 
Now, patching a game is extremely common these days, though changing a scene in a story-driven game after release is rare. What makes this even more notable is the intense reaction Andrew Allenson had when criticism was first coming out about this game. And knowing it was a very personal project informed by the death of the Allenson's mother, I can forgive that. I would be upset too if I had made a game carrying so much of my emotional burden and released it acting in earnest and then everyone aggressively and loudly hates it. But it seems as though the Allensons and Axe Studios as a whole are ready to acknowledge that Y2K is an imperfect project and are listening to criticism in order to improve it. In addition to changing the golden alpaca scene, they've also added a setting to make Alex talk less, which is just really funny, and retooled the combat so it doesn't drag on so much. And maybe it's better, but I haven't played it myself, so I don't know. And you know what? The golden alpaca scene is better. The updated version of the scene is largely the same dialogue-wise in the first half, though it is given a more proper cutscene, mostly made of still images using the 3D models. This doesn't entirely work for me, mostly because the cinematography isn't amazing and the old voice acting does not match the new images. In particular, the new cutscene has Rory crying and he's visually fragile, unable to even stand by the end of the cutscene. The voice work isn't bad, but his voice actor doesn't sound like he's crying at all, but rather he's in a sort of distress that more closely matched his sprites in the original cutscene. It's a shame, because I like the visual emotion shown in the updated cutscene a lot more, and I do believe Rory would be crying and too upset to keep himself standing during this scene, but the lines were not reshot, and the older acting and directing just doesn't work for it. However, ignoring its flaws, I am glad the scene is given a proper cutscene rather than more sprites talking. While I like the sprites more, they're inherently limited, and the 3D models offer more variety and expressiveness, so the intention of the scene is better communicated. Plus, it gives the scene much more gravity rather than if it were yet another 10 minutes of sprites talking at each other. Also, somewhat related, I really like the music for the scene. I think it properly emphasizes the emotion without getting distracting. I, I honestly, I think it's the highlight of the whole scene. But onto the main change, the golden alpaca is now given context for its existence rather than being a non sequitur. While the character is kind of an over-designed mess, the golden alpaca is given an intense, serious voice that gives gravity to his dialogue, which is great because a lot of what's happening is kind of silly and the voice acting helps ground it some. He is now some sort of reality police and has come to arrest the group with punishment of soul death for messing with reality too much. While the new scene does very suddenly pull focus away from Rory and Vela, it is still much better. There's a great feeling of surrealism to it that builds on top of itself, starting from discussion around the soul survivor and then bringing in the alpaca and the weird reality warping that comes with it. Like I said, it is not perfect, I have given my fair share of notes, but this scene does understand the problems with the original scene and work to solve them. It is more weighty, it gives you a moment to sit on the pathos building up, and while there are some shifts in the kinds of feelings you're experiencing, it is tonally consistent throughout. I don't know if I'd call it well-crafted, both because of that overwhelming doubt Y2K creates that I mentioned earlier, and because it's been too long since I've engaged with the surrounding context to be a truly fair judge, but I was invested in the scene, and the ideas were there. So, Axe Studios, genuinely, good job on this scene. I know y'all have been clowned on a lot, but I am more than happy to acknowledge improvement when I see it. There is no set of skills more valuable for a creative than that of receiving criticism, understanding where it comes from, and using that information to figure out how to change a work for the better. While not all criticism is fair, and not all suggestion and feedback are going to lead to the creation of a better work, it is all worth listening to, not necessarily to incorporate all of it, but to understand why people are saying it, and if you need to make changes in response to it. This is what we, as an audience and fellow creatives, can learn from the golden alpaca scene. As an additional piece of writing advice I could offer to any writers out there who need it, I want to talk about a fantasy short story I wrote a few years ago. The story, loosely based on events going on in a D&D campaign I was in at the time, follows a paladin in a self-imposed exile from her adventuring party after one of them died and got revived but lost their memories, and her process in deciding to come back. It was meant to explore the ideas of grief and the ways emotional pain often is coped through hurting relationships and failing to care for oneself. And holy shit was it bad, and it was bad for a lot of reasons. The structure didn't really make sense, the story had no room to breathe, because it was too long a story for the page limit I had. There's a lot of weird details and imagery that don't work. There's symbolism that's just kind of there. And also I wrote it in a week due to a combination of writer's block, procrastination, and that nasty habit I had yet to kick of abandoning most of my story ideas without even giving them a chance. Of course it's fucking bad. The only saving grace was that the characters were mostly okay, but even then the resolution of the main character's arc just really didn't feel earned. And something about it kind of reminds me of Y2K. 
while not to the same extent, there's a similar messiness there. At my program, it was heavily encouraged for people not to write genre fiction, though one could if they wanted to, and the utter shame I felt at turning this piece in for workshop taught me why. It's not because of snobbery, though yes, that too, but because genre fiction like fantasy and sci-fi and whatever the fuck Y2K is have a lot of extra considerations that you don't have to think about with non-genre fiction. It's important to nail the basics, things like sentence structure and grammar and imagery and character writing and pacing and story structure and exposition and dialogue and everything, everything, everything before you go on to complicate things. I'm not saying you can't learn these things while also learning world building and how to juggle explaining magic systems or familiarizing the audience with the unfamiliar while keeping the story moving forward, as well as the author finding relevance for their magic system and the like, but it's a lot easier when you've already got the rest of that nailed down. Also, Andrew Allenson, if you're watching this, you aren't, but if you are, you've either got to listen to your editor or you got to get a new one because holy shit buddy, this word count is unacceptable. 